Hey everyone, welcome to the 245th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patron Dempsey K. Tapley. I'm Oren Kaplan. And I'm Matt Emlo. Today we've got Carlin Hudson back on the mic. Here to womp, join womp, us. Womp, womp, womp. Sorry. <laughs> um, Carlin's here to talk I don't to know us. If womp is the right <laughs> sound. I think womp oh, yeah. is like What's a that? comedy What's that horn. Like? Like yeah. that. You womp, need more like an air horn. Yeah. Uh-huh. The, 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 okay, yeah, look. The Randy okay, horn, let's whatever. take take two. Just yeah, kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Back to one, everyone. Thank you. Sorry. We've got I, Carl. We've got Carl. Like yeah, Carlin, two take wonder. <laughs> Hudson. It's already, we're setting the precedent that this is going to be a fun and loose episode, but we are talking about something that's very interesting and important. The theme of the show is, I wrote a screenplay, now what? So Carlin is here. She's got a script in development that we've been talking about you know, uh, for a while now, but she's made some interesting steps forward that I think will help illustrate what uh, people should be looking to do once they've finished a polish on a screenplay that they're very excited about. So we're going to dive into that and get into uh, the ways that you can maybe expand your network, maybe um, build things out, set yourself up for success as best as possible in this competitive world of making movies. So Carlin. Thanks for thanks for joining us, Carlin. Oh yeah, happy to be here. Before we uh, we're jump happy in, to have you. yeah, we we're so happy to have you. Sorry, being rude. Womp um, womp. <laughs> <laughs> Go back. Um, I'm just gonna be taking notes because I I don't know if I've been in this situation where I've like written a feature script and been like, now what am I gonna do with this? What about your first movie? It was like based off a script that came to me, and we, you know, I, I did a pass on it, and I've. I've rewritten many things, and I've written many non-feature things. I'm trying to think. Oh, but you didn't write that one. Well, no. I, I think, Oren, you have the perspective of, like Carlin, of having taken something all the way over the finish line. But I think that maybe the thing that is pertinent to your experience, Oren, is that like you've had reps for a lot of your career. And so oftentimes, the first step is send it to your reps. Yeah, I've sent I've I've definitely done that with like treatments with proof of concepts with other things and I've had like the opposite problem like when I've done a movie where it's like hey we're going to shoot in 1 month and like if you want it you can work on the script <laughs> as much as you want until then but then we're shooting and so it's like the reverse problem where it's not like a now what it's like oh shit the it's like, deadline's oh, no. approaching yeah, yeah. let's make the script work cuz the script 100% It's not a now work. what it's a what now yeah. Well, great. Well, well, we will dig into it because I think also the other thing that makes this kind of a nice little triangle of experience is that I let go of my reps earlier, like, I guess really like late 2019. So I think like some listeners at home, I do not have reps currently to send my projects to, which I think is a, it's going to help kind of illuminate the different thought processes that we'll, we're all going through. So, um, but before we get into that, Carlin... What have you been working on lately? Well, let's see. This is going to sound like a joke and it's not, but I have a commercial for a real product called Deer Pong, which is like beer pong for children. Oh, okay. Uh, Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know, I, I thought I was seeing like like the <laughs> Buck Hunter video game. It's kind of like that. It's like oh, okay. for, it's a Hasbro it's for game. Does. They're children. Are deer. you pretending to murder animals for fun? I wish because that's hilarious, <laughs> obviously. Um, no, it's truly like beer pong. It's like there's a there's this little deer. And but there's no beer, cups. I'm assuming. No, but it has cups, and you throw ping pong balls into a cup. It's like on the it's it's on par with snorting pixie sticks. Look, <laughs> it's, it's like, a family it's like friendly game. Children. It's a funnier die and Hasbro thing, and it um anyway. So that's coming. I just shot that. And it's it's like one of those like we shot it a week and a half ago, and it's like coming out in a few days. Oh really? Pit- yeah, I'm pitching on some things. Um, Have you and done then- a lot of shoots like during COVID? I've done a lot of one type of shoot, which is Walmart and Echo interactive spots. Like Tim Wilk- Wilkheim is doing some of those too. So they're like pretty formulaic because it's, cause it's, you know, the choose your own adventure, like Echo stuff. So each episode really has like between 16 and 32 paths. So a lot of work. Yeah. But it's been, it's been kind of fun. Because you're shooting on set, like kind of normal studio. production stuff. 
Yeah, just like studio. Some of it was tabletop. Some of it was green screen. Some of it was like making things. Some of it was, yeah, like Santa being wacky, doing like crazy stuff with for family, you know, that kind of stuff. It was fun. He's I've done a lot of those. Stuff. Uh, Santa's just, he's a wacky guy. Um, and then I had a, yeah, I had a Netflix pitch for a writing job a couple days ago. So that's exciting because that was like a... I pitched my version of the book adaptation to the sort of like mid-level execs first. And then I made it to like the bosses of the two production companies making the movie. And then I had waited three months while the Netflix deal was closing with the lawyers. And then I did my final pitch for Netflix on Thursday like for the, so, the so team who's, let who's me ask, doing the So what did you do hiring. to kind of like limber up, right? Like those first few pitches, right? That you kind of you practice a little bit. It's fresh. You know, it's all really new. And then three months passes. It's crazy. Was, what, was there anything in particular that you did to kind of get back in that headspace? Or did you just kind of yeah, I mean, go for it? Yeah, I mean, I did like a, another pass and kind of like tweaked it. Because it's a 30-minute pitch. I mean, it's a, it's a real, it's a whole big-ass monologue. <laughs> and so, um, so I kind of like updated every section so that it felt, a little bit new to me or I would throw in some new jokes throughout to kind of keep it fresh. But you, um it, are there any like pauses for interaction or questions or anything built for into this your pitch? one? No, because for Zoom pitches it's a little bit different because oh, cause everyone puts themselves on mute. Yes. Yeah, so it's kinda like you just you have some banter and then you just go. This is my experience on Zoom so far for this kind of stuff. Could you see them? Yeah. Were they up or or was it They were okay. up. They were so, laughing. So they can kind of like they could like nod yes. and like show their appreciation, even though they're silent. That's and a great. couple that's of the producers had themselves off mute, so I could hear them laughing. You know, they're like on my team; oh, they're the one cool. that want me to, to to get the job. So they were kind of like, sure. yeah, "Ha yeah. ha!" You know. <laughs> and Netflix was Way like, go, Carl. "And Netflix was like, <laughs> so nodding. charming and smart and funny and insightful yeah. all at once. That's great." And, Wonderful. and Netflix like, people would be like this, and then taking notes, and then kind of like mm-hmm. you know, that's cool. nodding, nodding, and yeah. Jeffrey tubing yeah, yeah. a little bit here and there. Oh, you know, I didn't see any of that, and that's. Uh, but I did have my uh, pitch covering much of the screen. So who oh, knows good. what I would have missed? My commercial reps, whenever I'm pitching on a Zoom or whatever, they like constantly be texting me like, oh, make sure to talk about this. Tell them how great you are with actors. Tell them about your VFX. And it like drives so annoying. me bonkers. I'm like, anyway, so this is what I'm so excited about. We're going to, uh, you know, and I just like yeah. totally lose my train of thought and well, I lose who, like all the Who sounds it. cool when they're distracted? Not yeah. no and one. also Literally they're always no texting me about Literally things no one. that are like, I'll talk about characters. They'll be like, make sure that you tell them about your VFX experience. Like, I'm not even talking about that right now. It's like a totally different train of thought. (laughs) You're like, this is a mockumentary style parody commercial. Thanks for reminding me I'm disappointing. (laughs) Oh. It's very frustrating. But that's awesome that there are producers that are like on there just laughing (laughs) and like backing you up. Yeah, they're sweet. Especially the like, there's like one in particular like mid-level producer at this company who I think he's like the director of development. He's just like so sweet and excited and not jaded yet, you know? And so yeah, that's great. it's been great. Also, like uh, some people are more generous laughers than others, you know? So like if you have a few of them in the room, you know, it, it, it's remarkable how much of a difference that makes, you know? I remember it, it, because I am not, I love comedy. I love to appreciate comedy and I smile a lot and I like, but I'm not a big laugher. And I remember, especially like Comedy Central, we were taking pitches from stand up comics all the time. And so I really had to like lean into my listening skills. You know, like there's a lot of just like eye contact and smiling and it's nodding. It's exhausting, and, like, I bet. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Slapping. I'm a, I'm a that's funny guy, which is not really. <laughs> I'd say that too. That's funny. It's not great. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. That's not, we want to hear a laugh. That's funny. The difference between that's funny and a laugh is like whether you volunteer to do it. I've decided to say that's funny. Laughing. I can't help it. Right. I'm laughing because you made, you triggered something in me that like made me react in a positive way and I couldn't hold it back. All right. Every time I make you laugh, I'm going to do a little tally for myself. There you yeah, go. You That's almost right. Got a spit take. Earn my love. In recording. Just the end the way. Might <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, like work for I it. I feel like I've actually gotten <laughs> because of Zoom and COVID and everything, gotten pretty good at reacting to people, like on like visually. 
Yeah. Especially like in really? group type situations. <laughs> Sorry. Oh! Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, well, with you, I don't have to put on a show, but. Um, you might want to consider it. <laughs> It's a two-way street door. That's all I'm saying, buddy. I'm just saying, like, when I when I'm like talking to someone who I want to work with, I will like go, you know, go the extra mile. Like, yeah, and I, I mean, I honestly just try to listen to them extra hard because it's very easy to not listen to people when you're on a Zoom or like it's so yeah, easy sure. when you have emails popping up and you're looking at your computer and all that stuff. So yeah. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you. I uh, uh, you. also had a Netflix pitch. Uh, That's right. We- hey, how'd it go, buddy? That was awesome. Big laughs. Big laughs. Really good. <laughs> Everyone yeah, is cracking so- up. Are you fucking yeah, yeah. with me? Yes. <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, he is. Um, I was going to say, if you are a listener and you are someone that takes pitches or you work for an agency or you're a producer or something, like, keep your camera on because it's it's really, it's already hard to pitch when you can't hear anyone else, but when you can't see him or hear him. It's just like, it's literally feels like you're talking into nothing. It does. Which I know we've done a lot on phone calls back back in the day, but. Yeah, it, it does make me think back to like when we would, I would hear, like I'd be on a conference call and like, so, you know, someone would be pitching their hearts out and someone would, someone in the room would put them on mute and say something maybe encouraging or like, it could be something like, oh, this is really great. This is wonderful. We should buy this. Like, do what? What sort of what can offer can we make? But usually they or say, like, oh, "Lunch is here, right?" <laughs> yeah, it could be that. It definitely could be that, or it could be like, "This isn't working. Let's get it over with." I've got a lunch in fifteen minutes. I'd love to get to. Like, it, it, yeah. the gamut is is as big as your anxiety and hopes and dreams could allow. So, you know, I, I think that the the video component actually adds an element of uh, of uh, accountability. Okay, so Carlin, you've been pitching, you've been shooting a bunch of cool interactive stuff. How, how is that through your commercial reps, or how'd you get no, that? No, that came from this guy. Actually, it's the producer used to run Sandwich Video, which, for the record, I've never directed for. <laughs> but um, he found me somehow, and and I think that they hired a couple college humor directors just to do like basically this guy named Kirk. He was like the director of all these. He's done a ton of interactive branded stuff, but he couldn't do it all himself. Once at Walmart was like, we want you to do 50 episodes. He was like, oh, shit. And so he hired a couple directors to help him. I was only supposed to do like two episodes, but then they hired me to do like 14, maybe. Yeah, get it, Carlin. For our listeners, you might hear that Matt sounds a little different now. It's because he uh, was connected to the wrong microphone earlier. Yeah, just plug my mic in. Hey, everybody. This is what I really sound like. Okay, so let's get into the meat of this conversation. So you have a great idea for a screenplay. You're a genius. You write it, right? <laughs> let's say that takes a while to get to, right? Carlin's smiling already. What, Carlin, after you have that first, let's call it the, not a vomit draft, maybe you're, you're a couple ways through, maybe you've shown it to like your most trusted collaborators or confidants or or family members or best friends whomever it is that you just like that first first thing where they're not going to judge you no matter how bad it is what do you do next um you're saying after you've shown it to a couple people after it's like in shape but but still pretty close to the best so you've written a script you feel pretty good about it and you've gotten some overall general positive feedback from your friends and when we say friends, we mean friends that actually have read scripts before, not just like your friend from high school and your mom. So this is uh, this is because I, for the record, for listeners, I've made a micro budget feature in Austin for in the ballpark of a hundred k. A little we shot it for less than that, maybe like all in was around a hundred. Um, and then I have a feature in development now, which will be in the millions. Million. <laughs> no, it'll be less than ten, but more than. One, you know, somewhere between like two and five or eight, maybe. So what would what Hollywood people would call a small movie, but is small studio astronomically films. larger than yes, a bootstrapped DIY micro budget movie, right? Not but, micro, basically. But I mean, to to talk about my first feature, what we did when we finally got it to a place where we felt like it was okay to show people, which for the record, it never is. And we weren't ready, but you know, you Wait, make those mistakes. Are we talking mistakes. about the, the movie or the script? Oh, you the, know script. Uh, the script. Okay. Let, let, let's actually pause there because I think that's a more important question. 
I want to get to the the fundraising and then showing it to people point, but like your 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 point of like, oh, it never really is ready. Talk about that a little bit more. So you thought it was ready, and now with perspective, you're like, oh, there were things that we should have changed. What made you think it was ready, and in what ways were you wrong? Well, I've always, I, I'll never show anyone, I'll never show a script to anyone unless I've done. I mean, at least three or four, like, real drafts. Like, so getting notes from a couple people that I trust, rewriting. Getting notes from one or two new people, or rewriting. And then trying it again, and then doing, like, a typo, whatever, grammar pass. And so um, we did that with the big spoon, for sure. But... Um, it was the little spoon at the beginning, which is... Um... That's change. right. It was a big change. It was a whole metaphorical shift. You know, actually the first the f- <laughs> thank Sorry, you, that Warren. Was me, that was me working on a, um, that's funny. my reaction. Yeah, I was like, that Matt. was not a good laugh. Um no, that it's was me, uh, uh, it's me funny. jabbing Matt. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's funny, Carlin. That's funny. So we yeah, you know, it's like it feels like so long ago when I made this movie and it wasn't really. We shot it in twenty fourteen. At the end of 2014, yeah. not that so long ago, but then we started ago, writing really. it in 2012, maybe, or 2011. That is kind of a long, a time, long ago. time ago. So much has happened <laughs> since then. Yeah, no, it is. Um, it's... But yeah, I think there it does come a point where you don't really know what else to do with the script in terms of um, revisions. And you also kind of, you want to, pro- ideally, you want a producer. Right. Like I think that like in the in the perfect world, you have a producer come on who's creative, who is a creative producer, you know, someone who like gets story, who's going to help you with the money raising and the business side of it, but also make the best creative film possible. Right. And will also protect you from like casting this reality TV show star as the star of your movie or whatever, because there you go, because they have a hundred thousand dollars to give you. Right. (laughs) Exactly. So your question was like, when do you know it's ready? <sighs> or even maybe better, like, when, why did you think it was ready and in what ways were you wrong? Right? Because there, there's a little bit of like, you know, you just got to go for it. Right? You know, and like, so I guess I'm asking like, were the things you were kicking yourself over later? I didn't or kick like, myself. Would do differently? Or is it worth I, it just to jump into the deep end? You know, my first feature, I jumped in the de- into the deep end. I did not make a ton of shorts before my first feature. Yeah. I made... You were 17. Yeah, I was... It was last year. Um, Going on 18. Yeah, I was 20... You were young. You were young. I was but young. Also, to be, I'm giving you a hard time, but you had, like, in the Austin scene, you had been making movies with people. You were producing. I you had... Were in I had the, co-produced a Sundance movie, so I was, like, kind of thinking I was hot shit. Like, I knew... Some- people but i really hadn't made that much but i was like i want to make this feature so we we started we sent it somehow it ended up like in the hands of the producers who made celeste and jesse forever and then we were flown no we weren't we weren't flown we flew ourselves out for a big meeting at the paramount lot this was like maybe in 2013 and they like they liked our script they liked us but they basically wanted to buy it from us and hire new writers and we would have nothing to do it do with it as a quick side note that was your mm-hmm. first time on a lot, I assume. Yes. Oh, yeah. Paramount. I took tons of pictures. It, it, was wearing it, it a looks dress. so Hollywoody. <laughs> Paramount. Yes. You're like in Hollywood. It's kind of beautiful. Yes. It's got the arches. And Celeste and Jesse Forever was like kind of a similar. It was like a similar vibe to our movies. So like this is it. But we really sat in that meeting. And we were like, oh, they don't want to work with us, and they want to change everything. <laughs> Wait, who <laughs> it was is just we? like you the co-writer, the co-writer, okay. and I, who was also the star. Okay. Because we wrote it, we wrote it together as like a vehicle for her to star in and for me to direct. And so, how then did it if, get to their hands at the first place? Actually, I don't know. You know, actually, I think through Austin Film Festival because Austin Film Festival, it's such a bummer even talking about festivals right now because of the fucking disaster we're living in. But really, quite a few screenwriters and producers and stuff are involved in that film. That, and I think we that had met someone. That is really wonderful too. It really is. So we had met, we had met someone who knew him that read the script that gave it to him. It was that kind of thing. But then after that fell apart pretty quickly, we were like, oh, we want to make this on our own. And so then we set out, then we got, a, then we were a part of a lab, Austin Film Fest, Austin Film Society Lab, and then we got new producers. The, so actually, we kind of like switched producers' hands a lot 
but that's a different story. Well, so so the, the lab thing, I think, is actually probably the next step that I think is worth talking about, right? So let's go ahead. Let's say that you've kind of sent it around to people. You maybe do a table read or something like that. That's right. That's important. Right. Worthwhile to like hear it out loud and like yep. feel the pain of a joke not landing or, or the exhilaration yeah. of something clicking, right? Yeah, totally. Um, but then one of the first steps one can do as an independent filmmaker is look at labs or uh, contests, right? So you've got like, you know, some people I think are a little dismissive of some of those, but like certainly Nichols Blacklist, the Austin Film Festival, now that you bring it up, is I think a, a really exciting one. Sundance. Sundance. Thank you, Slam obviously. Dance. Never heard of it, um, Sundance. Uh, but, you know, we, we talked to one of a, a co-producer of a Sundance film recently. So that's uh, trust me, she's, she sounds game. pretty cool. Pretty, pretty. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I, I know that there is a, a a reasonable attitude of like, you know, those are the only famous. The, the famous ones are the good ones, and don't worry about the other ones, right? Is is a thing like you will hear from Mucky Mucks or whomever, and I kind of. Disagree. I disagree. Yeah. You know, actually, one of my really close friends, Laura Davis, y'all know her. Oh, maybe I can't. Whatever. I'll say it. Anyway. She, I'm not going to tell her about her script, but she was a part of this Joshua Tree lab recently that was like, it was last year. It was somehow, I was like, we got an invitation through Film Fatales. And she was like, whatever, I'm just going to submit who, I, the script isn't going anywhere like May as well. I need, I need like some momentum. And she met a producer at that lab who is a mentor who is now producing that film and like i had had a general meeting with him before so he's a real so so you this you know the joshua tree whatever is not like a well-known sure i've never heard of it and i love joshua tree right (laughs) who doesn't yeah i mean i think the a lab by the nature of being a lab is like exists for to somehow take projects and bring them to the next step in some way right 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 I, you know, I think I think that there's this prevailing attitude that like if you if it's not like one of the biggest festivals that you've heard of, and if it's not one of the biggest writers labs or biggest contests that you've heard of, then it doesn't count, right? Like people say that all the time, and and I think there's a big difference between there are some festivals out there and some labs that are designed to like take advantage of people, and it's really hard to know the difference between the two. But I think that there is a middle ground that maybe isn't going to impress you know a a hollywood mucky muck who's not in the independent world that's true they're gonna like look they're gonna stare blankly at you when you say oh i was a finalist for the joshua tree lab right that may may happen but that doesn't mean that there aren't a ton of huge like helpful aspects of working through a program and and focusing on a film that those programs uh, don't offer you know like that's really really valuable and so don't be discouraged if like it's not sundance or bust basically is what i'm getting at and also for the records so people know like i've had tons of friends whose films have gone through the sundance labs that don't play sundance and so and then there's tons of people's movies who had didn't set foot in a lab that do play sundance so it's just not like it's not like they're synonymous. It's not like you have they're to do one to They're literally different departments. They really are. And, and so, like, I've been rejected a, a bunch of times from Sundance. Who cares? You're moving on. You know, it's like from the labs and the festival, it's fine. Like, I still think that I could have a movie play at Sundance and not go through the labs. Yeah. Because it happens a, all the time. Without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But so the, that is one pathway, and it's maybe a little bigger than one would initially think right like rather than just thinking of the places that we can name off the top of our heads i think it's worth it to look at like regional spaces that maybe have you know something that like is there a local film society like carlin you were saying austin film society sf film is really great but there's smaller ones too like all sorts that we i'm sure i'm I'm not aware of florida i'm sure like florida film festival is actually quite a well-respected festival like i'm sure that they also have programs there you know and like maybe there's a director actually amy simons is from florida she might be involved in i think she is so it's sort of like wherever you are regionally too like I, I have, I know people who have volunteered to like to mentor people wherever they're from, also. So like Jeff Nichols is an Austin Film Society mentor. So is Richard Linklater, obviously. Robert Rodriguez, like all these people are involved with Austin Film Society, even if they don't necessarily spend all their time there. Yeah, I mean, it's cool. And even 
if you only look at like the Hollywood ones, there's a million of them. First of all, there's like a ton of diversity ones, right? That if you can qualify for any of those, those are really worth checking out. And there's like Imagine Impact. Do you know about that? Um, that's Imagine, like Ron Howard's company. They do, they have a whole program for pilots and a whole program for feature films that they pick, you know, like 20 people a year to basically really put team people up with mentors like some, and some do a pitch session. Big pitches. Yeah. 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 So it's like if you, if you look for it, you will find places to send your script. But it's it interesting. Not the only path. I mean, and Matt, I don't know if you mind me saying this, but like, I feel like a big reason you wanted to talk about this today is because you are in this situation. 100%. And I, and I do think it's, you know, even though I I haven't really been in this situation, I mean, I've, I've written scripts and I've read a billion scripts, but I think I'm going to say two things that are totally at odds with each other. One is I think if you're making like your first feature and stuff, you should you should just show people the script, you know, like all of my most successful writer friends are people that just sent scripts out all the time. Like they just wrote all the time and sent people stuff. And I read so much horrible stuff from them where I was thought they would never make it. And then they make it, you know, they get on a TV show, they sell a movie, they do because they are just constantly like showing people stuff instead of being afraid to, to show people stuff. On the other hand, the thing that I'll say that's contrary to that is like, you usually only get like one good feature script read from a person and that, you don't want to burn true. it. Yeah, and yeah, so you, you only get one at bat, which I think is a, an important thing. So, so maybe past those fest, uh, not festivals, but like the the labs of it all and the contests of it all, right. and they're kind which, of designed will, for people that don't have connections, right? Which is like a different yeah. than. I mean, yes and no. There are plenty of people with agents and managers and stuff who place on those lists every year. But regardless, right, like you can submit the same script. I know plenty of people who have like sent in a screenplay and then revised it. And then the next year, like landed a, like a, a higher placement for sure. For sure. I think it's probably their specific rules for each festival. But I know Austin for, for sure, like people have climbed the ladder in terms of like being a quarter finalist and then all of a sudden being on the top 10, right. you know. And there's the blacklist too, obviously. And I think I've mentioned this before on the podcast, but you know, I used to read scripts for the Sundance Lab. Um, like one of the first things I did when I moved to LA is, yeah, I had an internship there and I just read a million scripts and they, part of the way to get the internship, which just sounds so silly, is they would give you a script and they'd have you write coverage on it and they'd read your coverage and they'd see if you have like the right taste and the right I mean, sentiments. I mean, I think that's great. I've told the story on this podcast before, but it bears repeating that I was an intern at Warner Brothers in a, like a small pod in a shingle and I turned down every literally every screenplay that they sent us and then <clears throat> finally they were like what, a, what about this one and low and I was like pass it's garbage and they were like this one sold for 1.5 million dollars <laughs> this morning and the movie was called Click and I stand by my decision uh, Adam Sandler <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah hilarious yeah, yeah. I was movie. like this is just like Bruce Almighty it's garbage but it had a hook yeah, yeah. so they bought it Look, it had yeah. it. something just clicked um, listen so, you put Jim Carrey in anything at that time it was fine <laughs> anyway oh, yeah um, but, so, but so moving on though moving past because I think there are there are better resources out there for um, for filmmakers besides us in terms of like what different foundations and programs are out there what's the next step let's say you know you've sent that stuff out you're maybe waiting and to Oren's point you want to co- go ahead and kind of like pound the pavement a little bit more and move on to that next beat basically like of getting the movie made yeah or, or just figuring out what what to do next well there's a couple options one is attaching cast let's break that down let's talk about it okay well, um, because Carlin, that's a thing yeah. that you are in currently. I just, right? I just did that with my, yeah, with the feature, not the Netflix pitch, but like a feature that I wrote and will direct. Yeah, we just attached our our star, and it was we sent it out to a couple places before attaching cast, but they were like, or at least what I was told. Who knows what they actually said? They're like, we love it. We just like, we just want to. We'd rather, but but we don't. We can't attach ourselves until you have a, a lead. Because my film too, in particular, it stars a high school student, a high school girl, based on a true story. And like, without the lead, it's kind of sure. not. Yeah, it's kind of. It's not like 
yeah, it needs it needed like a star in the lead. Also because it's the main part, I think in terms of selling it or getting it financed, we needed to have that locked in. So after like sending yeah, a couple like early pandemic, we sent it to a couple places and they're like, Yeah, yeah, but like get back to us when you have an actress. So we've attached someone. She's very excited. It's also worth saying though that you are attached to a production company. So so producers are taking it out. So it's not just you cold. But I think I think that it is because I am in the same a similar position where I've talked to a few executives and they've been like, Oh, who are you thinking of? Who do you see in these roles? And it's not every role, right? But it's like a handful of roles. And you can in this case, I'd love to hear both of your opinions. You can kind of go big. Like you, no no one wants to hear like oh, I've got this movie and like maybe this guy that had yeah, six episodes guest star on, on Veep. Veep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Even if that person is great, they want to hear, oh, oh, Adam Sandler is going to be the star of this movie. But I think for like, what I was going to say is I've pitched high school stuff before and it seems for young actors the there's a lot of reticence to, to just assume you're going to find a perfect actor, you know? Like a lot of people want to be like, you know, how are you going to find this incredible 17 year old actor, you know, and yeah, and they want only... to know who the actor is going to be before they. And like they not to, to toot my own horn or whatever, but like there ain't so many famous 18 to 21 year olds out there. So like my list was very small. We really had Justin a very Beamer. small list. I mean, it, <laughs> yeah. It, well, Justin Bieber is 38. <laughs> oh my God. Um, and what, would uh, cast him in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. But no, no, but the, the point of like kind of in, living in that YA world, which like I come from, you know, it's like you're looking at like Disney kids, soap opera kids, especially if they have to be famous and oftentimes they need to they be. They do. They're, they want them to be. Yeah. 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 Like no one, you, you can't be like, hey, the lead of my movie is going to be this unknown. Yeah. Unless... Bo Burnham did it, but he was a YouTube star. Right. Right, and also like had and he had Paul Reiser and, and yeah, like you you have to really surround the you can rest. you can introduce like right like introducing, but you need the rest of the cast to be yeah. Like, I, I think of an episode where we had Clay, who was in distribution, mention how it's really easy as film lovers to say, hey, like you you can compare your film to a film that's famous. And say, well, they did it. But if you don't have the marketing budget to educate an audience about, say, 13 or 8th grade, then, you know, like, it doesn't, it's apples and oranges. And so, like, introducing someone, certainly that's a thing that I love it when movies do that. But, like, it's kind of a question of budget and backing and, like, you know, Bo Burnham was not only a YouTube star, but also like Judd Avatar had cast him in multiple movies. And like, he was like a darling. It was like, you know, so it's not quite the same thing, even though wouldn't it be nice if, if, if we were all as famous as Bo Burnham when we were making Right, but movie. Carlin could, I guess, and, and I know I just made the point of like having to cast someone, having your cast when they're young, but you could in theory take like a teacher character and cast like Zach Galifianakis or something, right? Like you could work outside in as well we, right yeah but then our budget goes down then it's a smaller movie it's like it, you know she's she's the lead it's her story so there's a principal character the principal character is like the obvious he's really a big the other main character but it's still her movie so we could have done it but but like this is a my movie's a little bit tough to get made too because it's political it's a little it's just a little um i mean the comp is election the comp is election yeah, yeah. Um, so it's not which was made 20 years ago now right yeah and reese wasn't so much of maybe she was like starting to be a star at that point but it kind of made but, her but not yeah not in the same way like she was you, you would say reese witherspoon and not reese right right <laughs> that's right um but my gal reese yeah right and again i think like knowing what your movie is in the marketplace i think is a thing that worth talking about right because there's a difference between like oh the principal character or the teacher character being a foundation of the movie where you can look at a movie like say 17 or something where you can cast a slightly lesser known lead but know that woody harrelson or someone of that stature can really sink their teeth into something and really kind of make an impact in a film there's that weird kind of balancing act of like 
finding roles that are big impact, high impact, but also not a huge commitment. And sometimes movie stars don't want to be like a 15% of a movie. They right. want to be a hundred percent of a movie. They want to be the right. person, right? If they're not getting paid much and they're like taking time on their busy schedules. If it's not like a personal passion project, then they want to do something that they haven't done exactly often, you know? Yeah. So, so I think having that sense of industry, understanding things, that's part of what a producer will bring to you, right? But that doesn't mean that you can't get an IMDb Pro account and kind of like put things together yourself and, and put together these lists. And that's kind of where I'm at right now, personally. It's like, you know, just kind of saying like, okay, like this is who I see. This is who would be great. You know, this is who is exciting, basically, to be straight up. Basically, an executive is reading it right now who's like a good friend, like an old, older good friend, which is kind of like, you know, another part of the equation, basically. But just because you don't have representation that you would send it to, like kind of working your connections is another part of it. And so, so knowing like, Oh, this is a movie that this person would like and figuring that out and kind of like, and you know, having that make sense is part of it. But so she's reading it this weekend. She really loved my lookbook. And so there's no producer attached though. No producer. It's literally, I finished the screen. I, I did a table read. I did a rewrite and I was like, I'm going to send it to one executive I know who I trust and who I know will give it to me straight and let me know whether or not it's worth sending around or not. And she saw the lookbook and said, hey, I'll read this over the weekend. I really like it. I would like to send it to a few people who are easy connections. And I think the thing that's important to understand for listeners at home is that like every person has a has a big network in Hollywood but there's really a few clutch connections like the people that came up with the people that like were their best friends when they were assistants or they went to college together or whatever those really really intimate connections are going to be their first thoughts always and so those are like if they're saying hey my good friend at this company, this is the right match. That's a special important thing to like, I don't want to say hope for, but it's like the, those are the biggest things where they, those people trust each other. It's not like they've gotten drinks twice a year for the last four years. They are like actual friends basically. And so we'll see, you know, like I, no one has really read it. So I want to make sure that it's not, that it's ready for prime time basically. But assuming that it is, assuming that it's good, the next question will be like, well, who do you see in it? Yeah. Well, and I guess for you, it would be like, would you want to attach a production company at that point? Potentially. Yeah, potentially. I think so. I think so. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, Carlin, actually, because, you know, I've gone down that road before and um, sometimes it's worked out and sometimes it hasn't. Yeah. I lucked out with my producer on the feature I'm going out with now because she is just has been such a good creative producer to me and obviously she's you know was nominated for an oscar and i feel like floored that she even wanted to work with me but um she's kind of like helped shepherd the project all throughout all the stages because when she said i want to produce this i'll never forget i think i told you all the story maybe not on the mic but um, she was like, I rewrite your script. You know, this is after she said she wanted to make it with me. Because she's like, you know, we need to rewrite it. And I was like, yeah, yeah. She goes, I reread it again. And I realized you're such a good writer. It's like, it's so fun to read. And the writing is so good that I didn't realize that you had a lot of story problems. <laughs> and I was like, uh, uh, oh, th- thanks, I guess. You know, it was just like, it was like a compliment wrapped in like, So I need to restructure it, you know, but yeah, I I do think for my project in particular, it's been really nice to have like that one producer who we have built over the course of a year and a half or whatever, like a very close working relationship. And so I can go to her to be like, are we doing the right things? Like, should we attach cast or should we just go to Netflix and see if they want to make it or whatever, you know? So I do, I do like having a producer because I also think if you have a more like a producer with some credits, that's an easier ask for the producer to say like, Hey, I have this director 
He's incredible. The script is so... It's going to be like such a strong debut. I want you to read this. That's, that's like an easier ask sometimes from a producer. It's kind of the same as from a rep. It's like going through a producer to, to the talents manager or a rep. It's kind of like, I think you can do both. You know? Not that you can't reach out on your own. But it's always nice to have that like vetted mm-hmm. recommendation. Which, which I think is maybe the thing that we're talking about ultimately it's like that first outside validation whether it's a contest or or something like that or a producer and so i think that that's you know or and that's kind of when oftentimes people go to you right they say okay we've got something that we're excited about and like now let's talk to this young exciting director and we'll start putting together a more complete package right did were was financing secured by the time that they were going to you with scripts or, or you kind of run the whole gamut talk to us about it a little bit you're talking about my first feature yeah or or any of the features that you've been involved with because i think that all of them have kind of a different origin story of where when you became part of the uh, equation basically relative to financing yeah i mean i don't know i guess i just think it's like it's to me, what's odd about this conversation is there's just like two totally different like places in the film industry you can be when you're having this conversation. You know, there's like you don't know anyone and you're just trying to make a movie. And there's like we're trying to make a calculated move to get stars in this movie to premiere at Sundance to sell distribution studio. Like it's just two totally different worlds. And I'm just trying to picture this conversation from our listeners. You know, we have listeners that work in Hollywood that are just like us that have some connections that know some producers that can send or have reps that can send the script out. And then I think we have many, many listeners who have none of that, who are, are like... Are scrapping it together themselves. They yeah. don't live in LA. They are, they just finished their feature. They think it's fucking awesome. They had their friends read it. They submitted it to the blacklist and they got some positive feedback and they don't know what to do next. They don't have a producer to just email it to, you know? Um, or a network. And so I, when I made my first feature, I was, I was living in LA and I knew some producers, the producers came to me, but they were friends. I had, I was literally like a camera assistant on one job. And I met this guy, Joe McAleer, um, one of the actors who, you know, we just really got along and he had this project and he knew that I was directing all these YouTube videos and things and little things for Disney. And he came to me and he's like, Hey, well, we got this movie. It's like a sports family film. He also knew that I like used to be an engineer and like was really good at squirreling away money and that I would be, put money into the project to direct it, you know? So it was like, because he had tried with a couple, he had a friend that directed a Sundance film the year before that was attached and they tried to get the movie made and they couldn't and they didn't really agree on the direction. And he's like, Oren, partner up with us. Like, let's do a pass on the script. Let's figure out casting. Let's figure out financing. Let's figure out everything. And so... Even though I'm not technically a producer on that film, I mean, I'm pretty much a, a, I'm an EP I mean, on it. As an independent filmmaker, like, yeah. you do a decent amount of producing no matter what. Yeah. And we, you do. Yeah. We ended I'll up pin on that. Yeah. We made it for like $750,000 and we just, you know, raised it from people we knew, like friends, like not Hollywood people. We had many, many, like, oh, the like, you know, Robert De Niro will play the small part if his production company, like all these like wild goose chases we went on and they just never ended up leading to anything like every story you've ever heard. So let's unpack that though a little bit, right? Because so you're talking about basically a screenplay that like you found financing for, right? But you still have to cast it, right? Mm -hmm. And so how did you go about doing that? Yeah, well, I mean, my movie was specific, like the lead character is deaf and after you quite quickly we realized like the deaf community would not be happy if we cast a non-deaf actor in the lead role and so we pretty much like found the most famous not even famous just the best deaf actor we could find and he's this guy russell harvard that played the deaf son and there will be blood right he was on but fargo and he's so would you say that you maybe made made a list no we just went, I mean, yeah, we, we, <laughs> the list to, is too short to, to write down. But, but my point is just like when you're trying to make a movie, mm-hmm. one of the first reasonable questions anyone is going to ask is like, well, who, who should be in it? Yeah. Well, so the, there's the, a grandfather character that was the next biggest role in the film. 
And I, my friend was Kurt Wood Smith. Do you know him? He was the dad from that 70s show. He was in RoboCop. Oh, and that's he's, fun. Yeah, he's been yeah. in a million things. Yeah, he gets liquefied in RoboCop. Yeah. Um, he's, oh, uh, it's so good. He's like, you look him up. You, you'll red, know, red, red from, from that 70s, 70s show. show. Yeah, yeah. He's been in a million things, a million movies. Kind of, it's relatively like, very much like if you saw his face, you'd be like, I know him. And he, I was kind of friends with him. I even took his headshots and stuff. Um, and uh, I, we were like, we made a bunch of offers and I was, we were like, we only know Kurtwood. Why don't we just like make him an offer? He'll do it. He's like friends with us. And it was like a week before the shoot. They're like, yeah, we got the script. He's got to take some time to read and whatever. Week before the shoot, he's like, nope. Um, and it was like a hard pass. It wasn't even like a negotiation about the money or anything. It was just like, no, thanks. <laughs> Man, that 90s <laughs> so, sitcom m- money. Yeah. You could say no to anything. So. Yeah, he's um, just chilling in the Palisade, sucking down pinas. Yeah. yeah. So we actually ended up casting that role after we started shooting because we. Which is pretty, which is more common than you would think. Like on my first feature, we had sort of one of our leads drop out the week before. So we were like furiously sending offers, mm-hmm. you know, through like agents at UTA. Which again is where that list comes in handy, right? E- even if like <laughs> every single person is a no, that you, you yeah. take a look at four or five or 10 names and you start to see a pattern. You get like what sort of type you're looking for. Even if you end up going way outside of that type, if you're like, oh, this is, let's go in a totally different direction. You know what direction you're avoiding then, you know? Yeah. And we ended up getting an awesome actor, this guy named Raymond J. Berry. He's, he had the same agent as our producer, Joe, but he was like the dad in Walk Hard. He was on Justified. He's like a big character. He's in 13 Reasons Why. He's like in... He has 128 credits on IMDb. You know, he's been on every TV show. He's like the shaman on Gotham and he's in Ray Donovan, you know, Dimitri. And, Ray, and he's like one of the main characters in the 100. It's just this guy people knew and he and he was incredible. But I don't know. I guess, Matt, I kind of feel like you're so plugged into kind of Hollywood. You know, you worked in development Comedy Central. You've been directing for a long time. You know everyone. You have a, an amazing podcast with a real charismatic co-host. So your situation might be different, but to me, like most people, when you're making your first feature, it's like, like, how are you going to get a star to be in your first feature? You know? Sure. Fair enough. When, fair enough. When are they, why would they sign up for it? Yeah. I, I think that that's, um, that's a legitimate question. I, and I think that the answer, look at the end of this road, it could be as simple as like, Hey, fundraise the money yourself, make it for as cheap as you possibly can. And just go shoot it. Just shoot it. Right. The, certainly, that's the situation. That yeah, or is the find a different for, hook for that, many, many people. Right. Right. Myself I mean, the movie, potentially the movie, included. You know. Yeah. The movie that we made was it started deaf deaf actors, and we knew that deaf audiences did not have a lot of movies made for them. They can't watch movies in the theater because they can't hear what the people are saying. And so we we did more that niche idea of like finding a thing, you know, and it, but making a mainstream movie out of it, you know. So right. Right. But Oren, I would say that, like, I feel like oftentimes you are like, well, we want to talk to people who have made movies with people we have heard of and that a lot of people are going to see. And so, like, I think that the question of how does one go about making a movie that's maybe slightly bigger scale or bigger budget or or has more famous people than the DIY micro budget movie, I think is worth exploring a little bit more. Do you know what I mean? Like, we all know how to, like, you know, ask every single person you know for money and, you know, take whatever that sum ultimately becomes and go into your backyard and shoot it, certainly. Right? And that's that's a great option for many, many people. And that's how we all got here. Right? And I think you just have to get lucky. Like, we just talked to those Palm Springs guys. You know, they made a movie with Andy Samberg and J.K. Simmons, but they weren't, didn't think they would. They kind of happened to get the script at the same time that they were preparing to make it on their own to these guys right right um, we, right sure and, and then look at your podcast last... that the, the plan is like get lucky right and i think that they're they're beyond just whether it's a good podcast or not what i'm saying is that there's a lot of things that people can do to create their own luck certainly luck is going to be a big factor in all of that right but like you can't say i want to make a hollywood movie i've already made my first micro budget diy movie and then when a producer is like, oh, interesting, the script's really good. Who do you see in it? And you can't be like, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Like, And there are multiple additional steps thereafter. 
No, of course that sets casting, you up for success. Of course, casting is important, but I'm not going to sit here and say like, if you write a script that's like decent, you're going to attach a star to it. If you've never made a movie before, if you don't have a Sundance short, if you haven't made the hit, I mean, like 84 billion view music video, yes, or if you don't that, have an incredible proof of concept, you know, like the guy that directed um, that Kristen Stewart Snow White movie, he that was his first movie. Yeah, and also the guys who made Palm Springs. Yeah, but they had a script that like popped off the page and people were super excited about okay, it. Okay, so what I'm saying is let's assume that they your didn't have is... Andy Samberg on a list anywhere where they were like, here's a bunch of famous people. That sure, were, but let, let's talk about the, the steps in which you, Carolyn's just like cringing. <laughs> She's like, I know, I just feel like I'm watching my like my sure. dad's argument. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you think, Carlin? I mean, is it. Um, you've made a bunch of movies, you have like all these credits, you're still. Kind of, you've been you played Austin Film Festival, you played South by, you've done all these things, and you're still fighting to get, you know, a feature made with right. And so my my thought was, Carlin, what do you do <laughs> to set yourself up for success? Um, I gotta go, you guys. Hey, this Carl, is uh, getting we're too not we're not putting Carlin in the middle of this. No, no, slight, no. Slight I agree with difference both of, of y'all. Yeah, yeah. We're both right. Is, is is certainly the case, right? Like, should you go shoot it? Yes. Should there be other ways, other ways to kind of elevate the film? Yes. Both are true. Certainly. Yeah. I guess just casting is like we've talked to a bazillion people on the podcast. We've been through it ourselves. All our friends have been through it, making these elaborate like who's the top one thousand people on IMDb Pro cast list, and nothing ever happens with it. That's not like how movies get made at least not not anyone that i've experienced i mean for my first feature we we basically started writing it because i'm not going to name the person but there was a a male cast member of girls the hbo show who we we like created the outline with because we knew him we met him like at a party or something you know what i mean like we just like Does knew his name this start guy with an a? it does Okay. It's down and to two um, people. yeah, <laughs> you know, Carl, you've got a nose for talent. Let me say that. Thank you, thank you. I see a f- semi-famous person at a party, and I just find a way to talk to them. <laughs> just kidding. That's not good advice. Uh, so we we created we we wrote the outline with him, and so because he was attached to our movie from the beginning. It helped us get a lot of traction. He wasn't famous by any means, but the fact that he was even on it... Well, he was a little bit famous. He was a little bit famous, but not a star. Like, could not... his Him being attached to our movie we did not get the film financed. Right. He hadn't like, done he's not that level. Yet. Okay, it wasn't that good. No. <laughs> it wasn't him. It's Alex. Uh, shh. But he couldn't do it at the end of the day. Anyway, so he we ended up not working with him. But his involvement with us in the beginning was gave us enough like kind of like cool indie street cred that we started to get some traction. So that's one way to do it, too, is like he wasn't the leading part, but he was like he kind of believed in us, believed in the project, lent his name to it. You know what I mean? That was how we kind of started that process. Right. Maybe that's helpful. Yeah, no, it is. I think that that's awesome. And that's like Pen15, you know, like a lot of filmmakers we've talked to like they started with the cast before the script was even made you know it just depends like what order you go in yeah and like look actors are want to be flattered like like any of us like if somebody who came to me with the script and was like we want you to do this and like we're shaping this for you to direct you'd be more invested in it because you're like damn this is just for me like i'm the only one that can really do this and actors are the same but matt sorry sorry i'm so adamant i guess i just feel like you're really harping on this casting thing and i i don't feel like it's it's I one mean, way it's, it's one, one part yeah yeah i think it's a part of it certainly like it's kind literally of like that's what carlin can, is going through right now or it is but i have reps and i there's no way there's there's not really i'm not really sure i could have gotten my leading person attached otherwise because she's not even really that active on social media and stuff it's sort of like her her team at caa got super excited about got the project. excited about it right yeah. We, yeah. We, well and i think that like the question of like how does it get to an agency's hands is gonna be the big one right and so an agency really what we're talking about is like it's nice to have external validation whether that's a proven producer with a track record or a contest or or reps or something else right like you have to have 
agents don't necessarily trust their own taste exclusively. Or even if they're like, hey, I think this is great, it's really hard to take that screenplay and be like, I think this is great, and that's it. Like, I think this is great, and it it first placed it at Nichols. I think this is another. Yeah, go for it. Another tip I'd say, honestly, go to managers. Because more often than not, man, if, a, if an actor has a manager, then they're probably more involved in their day-to-day career and, like, are going to champion smaller projects for them. That's at least my experience. And maybe are interested in becoming a producer as well because part of the big advantage of being a manager instead of an agent is that you can be a producer. And so perhaps they're, they're already invested in this actor's career. Perhaps they're interested in maybe being a part of building out the film as well right right maybe so that's good say, maybe that's not so good who knows who yeah it's a it's a toss-up but i do think that managers are are somewhat more easily accessible than like someone at wme or caa slightly you know it's still it's still not easy but it's a little bit better better of a shot right but uh, but I think. I think the takeaway i think that to Warren's point and to evidence by carlin like having a third party makes it much easier to approach anyone yeah and but i'll also say that you know i've had reps for a while i've worked with other people i've um was involved in this pilot presentation that we were pitching around town and like the person i was doing with it we were going through his reps and his reps weren't that into the project so they didn't really like push it you know like yeah yeah. your reps have to love it too i've shown my manager things it's like yeah i don't get it (laughs) <laughs> I had a movie that my rep disliked. <laughs> yeah. So it's like the the reps are, yeah. Like, I guess my, I always think, you know, you just have to fire on like all cylinders and like whatever, whatever, like no two features get made in the same way, you know? Without a doubt. So let's maybe, let's shift past the idea of casting, right? Like those lists, those a- attempted attachments, maybe they have them, maybe they don't. What is the next option for people? And we're talking about movies that are like, will have somewhat of a budget, not micro budget features. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, movies that there's the only option is figuring out how to get them made outside of just personal investments. Right. Like this, is, this can't be your, your pure backyard movie. Right. And look, there's a lot of gray area in between that. Right. Mm hmm. I kind of think it's like producers and production companies are the next step because um, a lot of production companies and producers have overall deals at places or first look deals at places. And so they just have like the bandwidth to develop things. Mm-hmm. Well, let's unpack that a little bit because I think that those are terms that people have heard many times. But a first look deal and an overall deal, like what does that even mean exactly? Well, a first look deal... Like well, I'm not, a, not I've never had one, but um, one of the companies that I'm working with has a first look deal at Warner Brothers, and so every project that they have, they're Warner gets obligated the first look at. Correct. Yeah. So they they have to take it to Warner's first and say, "Do you want to buy this?" And I think in exchange, there's like some they help Warner's like gives them some sort of money. Yeah, they get like a. Overhead. overhead yeah that, that's how you end up on the lot with a bungalow basically right right that's exactly yeah what this situation is um which yeah, is how I, that was my first internship hey what's and what it, yeah what's an overall deal that's like i don't know that one so much i think i said it and was like what yeah i think that <laughs> you know what i don't really know yeah i think they're they're quite similar but like i wouldn't i'll I, i'm not totally certain so like worth looking up but the the point is is that there are companies that are the lights are kept on by a studio so that they have the bandwidth to actively look for and develop out different projects and that's look i think to oren's point those companies are all still on short-term contracts where like no one's no one's uh future is secure and so everybody is still looking for easy yeses, easy, obvious, safe bets. So a first-time director with a screenplay with no actors that you've ever heard of is the opposite of what they are looking for, right? So really what we're describing is different ways to give them peace of mind 
uh, for when they want to invest in your film. No but you're also talking, like yeah, you're talking about like real studio, like a Netflix, a Hulu, Warner Brothers, Universal. Like there are companies that have output deals with like Hallmark or with Lifetime or with Shudder or, you know, there's company or Facebook Watch or something. There's companies that are like, we need to make seven Christmas movies. Like now we're on the hunt for Christmas movies, you know? And I think that is another way to go. And it's, you know, we talked about you working with a, a cast member from a, a different show, Carlin, or you're, you know, you're talking about casting. Like you can m- make totally original IP, like write an original script and go try to make it be, you know, and I think usually it will get made independently, probably if it's like your, your first movie, you can try to aim movies. You know that my, so our friend Ken Fuhr, I think you both know him. He used to work at Bonafide, this company, they produced um, Little Miss Sunshine and like Hamlet 2 and all these great movies, Cold Mountain. Should have done Hamlet 1. It's a yeah. bigger hit. <laughs> um, and they would, he'd be like, yeah, Natalie Portman's looking for a comedy. You know, like he would get these like tips of things <laughs> of, that people are looking for. And so like, so, so probably someone at Natalie Portman's company would be more willing to read a comedy script from a lesser known writer because she wants to do one and they're on the hunt and kind of being in Hollywood, you kind of can hear these little hints around, but, but you know, like a lifetime movie, a Hallmark, there's kind of these, like I did a lifetime movie. I don't, I mean, they, they liked my other movie, but they didn't really care. You know, the company I worked for needed to make three lifetime movies that year. So there's other ways to get movies made with like an okay budget. You know, we're not talking like 10 million, a hundred million dollars, but like $1 million maybe, you know? And so there, there are, I think ways to do that. And I like even, you know, your movie, Matt, it's, it's kind of a genre movie. So there, you know, there probably are places that like a sci-fi channel, you know, places like that, that are looking to make a certain number of movies a year and might take pitches and scripts and things like that from other places. I, I suspect that's you don't want to make a sci-fi film. You want to make an indie darling that wins Sundance and then goes on to Hulu or whatever, you know? Sure. Yeah. I I think that the, the thing that we're dancing around that maybe is worth, would have been worth talking about up top is that the nature of where we are in the industry, not just as like from an experience lover, but really from like a distribution and marketplace level, Like there's this kind of big shift that we don't really know how things are going to shake out on where, you know, streamers are the only name in town right now because obviously theatrical isn't really happening. And we're seeing, we just saw Warner Brothers shift their entire theatrical slate of 2021 all online. There's no possible way that a hundred million dollar plus movie or a slate of a hundred million dollar plus movies would be supported by a streaming service. Right. Can There's I ask no a really way. dumb question that I should yeah. have Google should just Google, but does Warner's own HBO? Yeah. 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 So basically, uh yeah, yeah. The the short answer is yes. So so that's why Wonder Woman is coming out on HBO and like all of those other big movies. But like even with astronomical numbers, that's still not a sustainable model for anyone, right? So the thing that I think that everyone's curious about and thinking about industry wise is like what what is that magic ratio of you know movies that are exciting to people that bring in an audience that keep people sustained keep them on the hook but don't cost literally a hundred million dollars right and if you look at netflix and maybe some of that stuff is the prestige stuff but a lot of it is like those middle of the road like cheaper rom-coms and like Here's sign me up thing. right but the other thing is a like like and i'm going this with my film right now is like we just got a pass i think i mean we got a pass at netflix because we're too political the movie whatever that's fine i was like thank you um but then like amazon is like we love the script but we would rather like but we don't want to finance it but we were going to track it and like for distribution the, yeah and so and like the star ah, this is gonna give away who the star of my movie is but whatever they're she's the lead of one of their big movies right now but they bought that movie at a festival so like amazon hulu all the a lot of these things were were made independently and then purchased by streamers amazon is like a really unique situation too because i feel like they 
are the most bullish in a festival market. But so, right? but like, like so, Netflix and all, a lot of these places, they're all they're a twenty four too. They they too do not find us as many movies as you would think. They just dis- distribute just a bunch pick of them. them. Up. Yeah, yeah, totally. So a lot of these movies that are like we would use as comms for the stuff we're talking about uh, were still independently financed and then purchased afterwards. Palm Springs being one of those. But again, exactly. I think that that speaks to the nature of doing something that perhaps is you know something that like perhaps you can find financing for there's a bigger win out there for those smaller films at this point right you know what was an independently financed film magic mike there you go one magic mike one they made that for five million dollars and then they sold the ip for a lot of money and magic mike 2 was a shit ton of money they all made a lot of money Cut off of that my wife went to the vegas show. the stage show hell yes yeah. That's right. Um, separated rights. Well, look. So, look. Obviously, if any of us had the the silver bullet for how to get these, you know, the movies of our dreams made, we probably wouldn't be spending time talking about it on this podcast. We'd be out shooting. Um, but nobody's. Sh- but it's hard to shoot things right it, now. It is hard to shoot things <laughs> right now. Can I tell you? So, my manager Jacob, he's in Toronto right now with a client of his who is directing his first feature. It's. A, Big good budget, Maher Ali starring in it. Um his first feature? Yeah, but he made this short film called The Stutterer that was like famous. It's really good. Then he made a second short film that's also equally incredible. Also about a guy who like has communication issues. So this and he had written this script and it just like people fell in love with it, you know. So that on top of his like festival wins and awards and like people there's literally like twenty video essays on youtube about why his shorts are so good you know and then he he now is getting his first movie made and and again it's not like a hundred million dollars but i think it's probably like you know in the 10 million dollar range that's incredible that's pretty unusual so yeah so um there there are like stories me, or you can be like me who's already made a feature and lots of festival favorite shorts and people's managers say who is she's never done anything why would we why would we let her do this movie? Anyways. Right. We, Anyways. But which I think is really actually super valuable, Carlin, because I think that like whatever side of the coin you're on, it's easy to be like, oh, well, once I get that, once I play South by a couple times, it'll be easy. Right. I've heard that so many times. It's so interesting. Yeah. And I'm like, if only, if only it were that were, that it was like, people will say like, oh, I'll just get one short in the sure. South by and that's what it is. And I'm like, trust me, I've had multiple yeah. in South by. And also though, you have a script in development, right? Look, so we aren't so, talking about that. <laughs> look, look, you're not rolling till you're rolling. Right. right. But so I, the, the, again, the whole point of this episode is like, what are the things that a, you can do to figure it out? So I think, or to your point, like, Proof of concept certainly is one. And and the other thing that I think is worth bringing up, uh, where I've talked about this ex- executive, who knows what, what's going to happen with that or whoever else I send it to, but the thing that worked was a good lookbook. Like, she didn't have time to read it, but she knew whether or not she was interested in learning more because at her own pace, she could click through a good-looking lookbook. What, not even a short, you know, not, not like... Like something like literally you set your own pace with a document like that. You can you can be as involved as you want or you can skim it as much as you want. And then you know. And like the answer could be like, no, this isn't for me. But I think that's another thing that you can add to your arsenal. Uh, Carlin, you've made lookbooks, obviously. Oren, you've made a million treatments. It's the same sort of process. I made some lookbooks too. Um, Ooh, but uh, I send y'all. I sent y'all yes, my lookbook. We so we've seen your lookbook. It's awesome. Are, are nice. we? Is the name of the movie public? Yeah, fuck it. Sure. <laughs> so yeah, so I've seen the Caitlin versus <laughs> lookbook. I guess I'm curious now that Matt's brought this up. Was that at all? Was it helpful? Yeah, was it helpful yeah. in any way? I think so because um, yeah, I think it was super helpful. I think for me, the combination of like a script that they responded to some shorts that were really great and the lookbook were kind of like the the three things that made them say yes. I mean, but what's the first thing they looked at? Probably the lookbook, right? I don't know. Cause that's the easiest. I have to ask my managers and and my producer, but I don't know. I mean, at least, uh, 
just based off of how one receives emails, right? <laughs> if you're mm-hmm. if you're <laughs> on three Gmail, attachments, you see there's three attachments. <laughs> one of them, and I noticed actually a friend of ours sent a screenplay the other day, and I noticed that he had scaled up the font on the title page so that it was eye catching and legible. And I was like, oh, and immediately I did that. But like normally, like a 16 point cor- courier, you're not going to be able to read whatever they're. No, you're right. Is. They would have clicked on the look. They, they'd be like, no, oh, there's like a picture. short film, takes five, 10 minutes to watch. You need sound. There's a script. You're like, oh, God, who wants to read scripts? And then there's a the lookbook. Ooh, cool. This pictures. is the dumbest way of thinking of it. But like, if you're, if you have a, a few minutes of private time and you're seated down and like, like if you're in the bathroom, what are you going to pick? Yeah, first? My- <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, like that's probably not not literally what the situation is. But what would you do? What would any person do? They click the picture first. Yeah, you scroll I through the lookbook. Think lookbooks are really important for because a script could be like we could have the the three of us could direct one script in three wildly different ways. And so, like, if you're the writer and director, how what's your vision to execute this script? And like, I do think that's really, that's really helpful because it's not, it's like my script could be in somebody else's hands could be a very different movie. Right. Well, and, and the, the benefit of the, the table read that I had a few weeks ago was that I learned that it took people a minute to lock into the tone, even though like there's some very goofy screen description, like on the bottom of page one, I liken someone to a horny cartoon skunk. And people are like, that's like pretty broad in my book. And people played it straight for a while. I mean, most skunks are horny. Yeah. Cartoon ones, especially. Um, That's true. But so you, but you scan the lookbook and you're like, oh, I get it immediately. And then all of a sudden those tonal questions don't bubble up quite so quickly. And then they get the horny cartoon skunk skunk joke a lot faster. Yeah. It just processes faster. I think the lookbook also gives people like permission to start reading a script or even watch a short. It's just like a big investment. But if you know that the person has like quote unquote taste because they chose, you know, art, artful f- or cinematic photos or funny things or like they, they have a style or a vision or something in the lookbook, you know, even if it's just a cool layout or like super poppy colors or like I think Caitlin Versa has kind of like a retro look a little bit, right? like a little kind of Juno-esque or something. And then you look at like Matt's lookbook, there's some, there's, there, it's like a sci-fi comedy, but it's like kind of almost like pop comedy. You immediately like are like, okay, this is a legitimate artist, creative person, you know? Because we've seen, well, we've all seen lookbooks that are like, yeah, this is hard to look at. I'm not interested in looking at the script. So it's, it's like, hey, I have taste. I know what's up. I can write a funny log line. Can we talk about what makes a lookbook bad actually? Right, like Carlin, you're you're rolling your eyes. Yikes! Right. Yeah. What what makes them bad? To me, if they're really messy and hard to read, that's kind of like top level bad. Unless it, I mean, I guess there's a way in which you could do like a really artful, messy lookbook, but I I I don't think just you need to be able to read it. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah, Yeah, and legibility. Yeah, yeah, and also like. Get just get someone to if you do, like I don't know I don't use InDesign like I nine times out of ten hire people to do my treatments and my lookbooks and like to do the layout to design it so I'll write it I'll source the images and I'll work with them but like it's not it's not cheap. it's not you can find people who are not that expensive and like for a couple hundred dollars help you but like if you can afford that or if you can save money to have someone help you do that it really makes a huge difference because it because like there there are filmmakers are out there with like really slick really fucking cool lookbooks and that's who you're competing with so it has to look clean it has to look intentional cohesive interesting yeah i mean it has to the photos have to be high res they have to feel like they belong together in some way and you know i'm a big believer in that like a lookbook you should be able to like scan through it in like 15 seconds but if you're willing to put in 15 minutes you'll get more out of it but um but you already have like an idea of tone like 15 seconds and so what not just photos but like head headings headlines let's say you're doing a um a lookbook for a movie that takes place in the 60s about journalism right like like use like some like a news font for your your headlines or like kind of get start Telling the story just in the design of your lookbook, I think it's good. And when you get lookbooks where it's like every page looks the same or it's like 
clearly done in Word, where it's like a title, some text, and a picture. You know, I obviously, you know, we're all trying to make cinema, so you want like at least a 16 by 9 like landscape layout, like when you get these portrait layout like press kit type things they're just not fun to look at or read also like collages and that are all kind of collages like are a, my number one pet peeve yeah like a little like a yeah. kid like pasted a bunch right. of like, pictures on top of each other and look if, not if you look. do like a tiled out like a layout where everything looks intentional and clean and like that's not to say you can't have multiple images on a single slide but if it looks sloppy that's bad if it looks like you know like you're doing like a, a virgin suicides riff or something like that. And it's literally cut out tears and you can feel like scotch tape or if it's an aesthetic, that's different. But like Carlin, you're saying like, you know, if you, if you're dealing with multiple aspect ratios, nothing's cropped to be the same way. The color palette is all over the place, which it's, it's striking how bad that can look. Yeah. Cause you're uh, trying to pitch yourself as a storyteller in a visual medium. You should have some visual taste like just right off the bat, I think. And then if you can write like a great log line on the cover and the second page, if you can give us hints of character without saying like, Carlin is a, you know, 32 yeah. year old woman. Carlin living means in to Los grow. Feliz. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> then, so, you know. Sorry, Carlin. Yeah. You're a completely fully formed human being. <laughs> <laughs> Um, We're always changing, evolving. Well, let's hope all our projects get off the ground, whatever they may be. <laughs> the way he said Here's that was funny. That, yeah. <laughs> well, well, let's, let's hope our projects get off the ground. Um, yeah. I still oh, um, um, believe in the, yeah, just make make a lot of stuff, show it to a lot of people, and at some point, someone will just think something you made is really cool and and go with it, you know, whether it's an actor or a producer or an amazing cinematographer that just shot this movie. Oh, oh, I wanted to plug one thing we I've talked about in the podcast before, but the movie Hustlers, the director made an incredible uh, ripomatic that pretty much got her to be taken seriously. Really? Yeah. And it's available to watch. Yeah, she posted it on Twitter. Um That's cool. I'll send it to you. It's so good and it's because at at its face, even the billboard actually I think the marketing was like not that great for that movie. But it feels like, okay, it's Jennifer Lopez and she's like a stripper. And like, okay, I kind of get it. It feels like it'd be bad. But if you see the way that the the director approached telling that story and how why her movie was going to be more about the art of these dancers than the sexuality of it, like the just changing the, the point of view on the storytelling. And she did such an amazing job of showing that in this ripomatic that got her taken seriously. She had written the script, too. But, you know, but she had to really fight to direct it as well. That That's like, you know, just keep keep building this world any way you can do it, whether it's by attaching a famous person or making a proof of concept or making an awesome look book. I think just the more people are seeing that this is a train that you're driving, whether they're on it or not, the more they'll want to like hop on it. It's my opinion. Without a doubt. Well, great. Well, Carlin, this was excellent. Thank you for joining us. Do you have a few minutes to hang out and endorse with us? Unpaid endorsements. Are we allowed to endorse things we haven't actually used yet? Yes, I think I did. I endorsed the gun that shoots flies, the salt assault gun, bug assault. I was so excited about it. My friend was like, this is amazing. And then I got it and it just made a mess it of my house. There's just salt, salt everywhere. Um, and it didn't, it did not get rid of any flies. So I had to unendorse it. Anyway, I'm doing this again. I'm endorsing something I haven't checked out yet, but there is this editor on YouTube. His name is Hillier Smith, H I L I E R Smith is his last name. And he is the guy that edits Logan Paul's videos. And he has a whole channel about his theories on editing and what makes good editing and what makes bad editing. And I do believe that like something like about like a Logan Paul and like a Casey Neistat and like all these people were like advertisers like, oh, it's Logan Paul is just like walking around with the camera. Let's just do that. And you're like, dude, you do not get how good the editing is. You know, what's funny. You made me realize I've never seen a Logan Paul video. I've seen a Casey Neistat video and I think of him as kind of like the the most craft oriented vlogger I can think of. Yeah, um, no, check out Logan Paul. It's like, it's like I'm not, kind I'm of not going to, it's but, kind but of I'll pure garbage, but in a way where like the yeah. real housewives or something, you're like, 
cannot stop watching. If you know? there was a way that I could take views away from him and also observe him on a a, a academic letter level, I would maybe do that. But um, well, just you know, yeah. So Oren downloaded. Use Tor. <laughs> oh yeah. To I'll, I'll pull some of his videos and I'll send to you. I think there he'll you still go. get a view. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, so he makes all these video essays about editing and like what makes a good shot, what makes a bad shot, and he. That's pretty cool. I discovered Is him. Is it useful? Well, so I, the reason it's hard for me to give a full 100% endorsement is I've only watched like one section of one video. And the reason I know about him is because I bought this um, Ronin, you know, stabilizer gimbal thing. And I, so I was watching videos on YouTube of people doing cool shots with it. And this one guy made this like awesome chase sequence through the forest where you see like, you know, he's running at full speed with this gimbal, shooting someone running between all these trees. And he's like, oh, we're trying to recreate this shot from Sherlock Holmes which is this like $125 million movie. Sure. We're trying to do it for yeah. no money because there's this like an amazing action sequence in Sherlock Holmes. It's the one um, where like the trees are kind of exploding and it's like speed ramping and stuff, right? Yeah. And so that guy showed a video of this guy, Hillier Smith, talking about why that scene is so good and what makes it good. And he talks about these trends of like the shaky cam. You know, like 10 years ago, everyone was doing action shaky cam. Like ever since, what's his name? Uh, oh, Paul Greengrass. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Kind yeah, of a coin toss. Movies. Both of those guys, I think, are the same person. Yeah. Well, I feel like Paul Greengrass is messier. Doug Lyman, he's kind of, I feel like, has a wider breadth of style. Anyway, but so everyone was doing these super shaky things because they you felt there was a lot of cuts and you felt like the action was more intense when the camera was moving all over the place. It was more frenetic, but it was really hard to understand what was going on, right? And then as like John Wick became really big and we saw all these actors do all their own stunts and it's really amazing choreography, we kind of started shooting everything wider, like wide and medium shots and not cutting as much. But the it, even though it was clear, much clearer what was going on, it was like less visually like stimulating because things weren't moving as fast. And so he talks about how Guy Ritchie and Sherlock Holmes managed to, he does these ramps from like super slow motion to super fast motion and how he combined this super frenetic movement of the camera and scenes and foreground and layers with like a scene where Robert, uh, Robert Downey Jr. almost gets hit by a bullet, but it like barely grazes his shirt, you know? And he's like, how do you clearly show that while also running at 100 miles per hour you know like through a forest with things exploding all over the place so and logan paul's editor answers this question he analyzes it he's like fascinated by what makes um you know cinematography interesting and editing interesting and storytelling interesting and so anyway well, I, I just subscribed to him a on new YouTube. job soon uh, I he's british will check if that makes out. any sense or maybe Honestly, that's any uh that does validation. help because listening to an american talk about this i couldn't handle but a brit <laughs> yeah. i might be able to uh, stomach it. carlin let me recommend avoiding youtube.com <laughs> done oh come on <laughs> uh, uh, awesome carl <laughs> i love youtube no. by the way I like re fallen in love with it. Um, we know, <laughs> Oren. <laughs> no, there's a, a ton of incredible stuff to learn uh, on YouTube. I got a YouTube endorsement, so this is this will be perfect. Uh, mine is full of uh, of uh, fun and sunshine. Um, do you guys know the YouTuber? She's a little girl named Not Nandy Bushel. She's a drummer. Oh yes, did she have like a she had battle a commercial? With, uh... She had a, a battle with Dave Grohl relatively yeah. recently. She was yes. in a, co- a Christmas she's also commercial British, right? last year. Yeah, she's an incredible drummer. She's quite young. If you've seen like uh, an intense and highly skilled young girl drumming her face off, this is Nandy Bushel. But like, especially like early in the the pandemic, just like watching a kid just shred and like love it and like scream at the top of her lungs to a Foo Fighters song. D- you know it's reinvigorating that is for sure she's so, very she's very cool so good and also kind of makes some kind of bad songs from the 90s much more enjoyable you know like the foo fighters is maybe like the top of her oeuvre you know there's like a lot of like pretty bro you know grunge which i was so into as a child so um you know yeah it was super fun uh, but just watching somebody who's very enthusiastic and skilled exhibit their trade is awesome. So, um, so you, it's rare that you see something quite so stark. And uh, Nandy Bushel is uh, she's done that, and she also, like Orrin said, she 
got into some sort of YouTube duel with Dave Grohl that was kind-hearted and, and fun as well, and they, they drummed against one another. Yeah, it was pretty sick. Carlin, what uh, about you? Thanks, Matt. I'm going to... you watching any good shows, good movies, reading any good books? Not really, taking any good I'm walks? going to... Um, I've been I'm watching so much Bake Off, you guys. Yes. Like so Can much. I recommend an article? Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> uh, a friend of mine has an article in the the New Yorker this week. Mm. This week's ooh la la edition. Yeah, I know. Much. Yes, I was going to recommend <laughs> Mariah Carey's Christmas special. Oh, but you I should. Went with the New York, it's actually not. Is it that a, good? Oh. It's not bad. Is that There's, the one with Ariana Grande and Jessica Hudson? And I mean, barely. They're barely in it. It's hard, could they were on the market? They are literally in one song, barely. Um, Mariah Carey. Mariah Carey is a is an icon. I love her. I I love it. It's not great, but it's fun. But this this article <laughs> is called "Using the Homeless to Guard Empty Houses," and it's um, Francesca Mari is the writer who i know yeah we're not like good friends but you know she's you saw that she shared it on facebook no i actually get the new yorker <sighs> my dream is to be friends with you mean you let them right pile now. up in your apartment is what you're saying i you know the, what it, i've it, read them pretty close to cover to cover the in, weekly, in the pandemic pretty rough well there you I go know. well done i read at least like two-thirds that's pretty good that's great that's pretty good I always read, you know, what the going on's mm-hmm. about town. And then I read and like murmurs, two to three. Sure, yeah. Sure. <laughs> then I read like two to three articles. But it's it's about um uh, I love the cartoons. I love that. But it's it's a really if you're if you live in LA in particular, it's about like a a kind of interesting way that some homeless people are being employed to guard vacant houses in gentrifying neighborhoods. So it's kind of interesting because it's about like, oh, that's great that we're giving homeless people a job, I guess, but it's really complicated because they're in gentrifying places. It's but it's just like an, I was like I had no fucking idea that and like we're in the middle of kind of a big upset about it, yeah. right? Like there's yeah. a lot of protests going on about this whole issue, basically. Yeah, it's really, but it's really well written and it's just like fascinating that this is happening. That's cool. So there you go. Well, great. So the Check Mariah Carey Christmas special, and if you happen and to subscribe sure. to the New Yorker, then you can read this article. <laughs> that's right. Look. Hey, listen. That's what incognito mode is for, right? There you yeah. go. Yeah. Oh, that's an endorsement. Really? If I read like a Washington Post article in incognito mode, I can read as many as I want a month. Or, and you're one of the most tech technically proficient people yes, I, I have know. Stupidly Are you serious? Pay for all these dumb newspapers. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, have an look. LA Times subscription, a New York Times subscription. And I just don't read Washington Post articles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I endorse Oren's uh, patronage of the of the news media. That's nice as well. So, oh, wow. good on you, Oren. Incognito mode. I will do it. Yeah, Thank you. but th- that is the way you can get around if you're trying to read an article or two. Awesome. Well, Carlin, uh, as always, it's been wonderful. Keep us up to date on all of your goings on, and uh, we can't wait to watch. All of the movies that you have coming out and all of the projects and all of the commercials and, and all, all of the... the various paths we can follow in your Echo Choose you Your Own Adventures. Yeah, yeah. So many paths. Tell us the good Hundreds. one. How do I win? <laughs> Hundreds. Okay, what are you on Instagram? Hey, I'm Carlin. No, at Carlin Hudson. At Carlin Hey, Hudson. Carlin is my Twitter account. Hey, Carlin. But I don't tweet as much as I Instagram. Okay. So... And you, will we get cool film shots, selfies? Oh, like that? yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot. Like in masks, peace sign. I have been fanny doing... Fanny pack. <laughs> Ooh, That's just shoot it hat on occasion. That, that, yeah, that, I wear a just shoot it hat in roughly half of my onset photos. I saw yes. Carlin on the street the other day as I was wearing dying, it. Wearing it. And I was like, this is great. <laughs> that is awesome. Great. I so shouted really out like a crazy person. Y'all should, just, y'all should pay me to wear Has those Has anyone hats. ever asked you about it? Like, oh, what is it? Oh, yeah. Really? Many, many times. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Cool. You, and you, yeah. you you told Made them uh, you should you should check out episodes 144, 261, and uh, you, yes. you just listed all the ones them. that you're It's a, actually my newest tattoo. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Well, <laughs> get ready to get inked up a little stick <laughs> and poke yeah. here in the, the pandemic yeah. situation. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, if you want to learn about the things that we talked about on the show, you can visit us at Just Shoot It Pod. Dot com uh, across all social media at just shoot a pod we're adding more fun 
photos and tidbits and different things here and there. And if you want to be reminded about when the show comes out, that's the easiest way to keep track of things. You can follow me at Mr. Matt Venlo. And you can follow me at O. Kaplan on Instagram. I'm at Smitty Pileg on Twitter. Also, if you want to email us, we love to hear from you. We are just shootapod at gmail.com. Uh, and our amazing editor is Sarah Weirda. She edited a very long episode today. Uh, Thanks, Sarah. And Shout out our to Sarah. Social media master is Derek Aiello. Our webmaster is Ewan Williams. The music you're listening to is from their free music archive and the artist Jazar. And thanks, everyone. Stay safe. We'll see thanks, you guys everyone. soon. <laughs>